Hello and good morning. Welcome to our presentation today, Lift and Shift, your SAP landscape on AWS in four hours or, or less. It's obviously a presentation about migrating systems, uh, specifically migrating SAP to Amazon Web Services. I'm going to go into more details of that in a, in a minute. But as a general concept, we talk specifically about AWS, but it's, it's really interchangeable. Uh, we can do this on Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Platform. We can do the same on Azure. And for the matter of fact, we can migrate from anywhere to anywhere. So don't get sidetracked if we keep talking about AWS. It can be really working on any cloud, from any cloud, on any infrastructure. Also, we focus this a little bit on SAP. Of course, since we focus on SAP, but this is also interchangeable. As long as there's a database, as long as there's files, um, we can move this consistently. So let's get started. I want to introduce myself and my um, my co-worker, Wamsi. My name is Bernd Bayer. I'm a senior solution architect with Libelle, working here in Atlanta. And my co-presenter is Wamsi Malavarapu. He's going to do a live tool demo in the second part of the presentation, where we just show you the interface and what we can do with it, specifically in the context of migrating system. Some of the highlights we want to touch today is what are the general options for cloud migrations? I get a lot of emails and I get a lot of um, talks on, on, on the conferences, how to migrate, zero downtime migration, heterogeneous migration. So I want to spend the opportunity or take the opportunity to clean up and clear up some of the terms that are being used, um, how we get the cloud systems ready for migration, prepare the SAP base installation, prepare database replication, file replication, and then basically going through the workflow from setting up the systems, uh, doing uh, initial sync, mock migration, uh, production migration, and the cutover weekend. And then again, we look at the live tool demo. <clears throat> so let's start with the uh, introduction. So uh, about our company, we are called Libelle. We have been on the market for almost 25 years now developing and marketing enterprise software to medium and large enterprise customers. We also, of course, work with smaller customer, but by nature, if you run SAP, you typically have a certain size um, in your uh, organization. We have more than 1,500 installation of our software products at more than 400 corporate customers worldwide, and 80% of our business is carried by, by SAP. Our solution portfolio, we have our data replication uh, division, which is replicating databases based on log replication for different platforms. We are supporting all the SAP platforms. We are supporting non-SAP systems based, for example, on MS SQL Server or, of course, SAP on MS SQL Server. But we are also venturing out in ProgressDB, DashDB, MySQL, and specifically, the cloud is coming up more and more as replicating from to between uh, cloud systems and, and use our tool set for that. We also offer system refresh automation solutions, specifically our system copy tool that is automating the homogeneous system refresh for SAP. We have a solution for data masking where we uh, obfuscate uh, sensitive data. We have a solution for IDOC monitoring, SAP monitoring, and the Offering we are talking about today is the lift and shift cloud migration, which is a combination of our data replication tool and services we are offering. Let's talk about the um, migration concepts in the beginning. So I want to talk about and introduce four generic concepts. First, the migration pass is it homogeneous, heterogeneous, cloud, on-site, on-premise? So I want to sort this out a little bit. I want to talk about the difference between relocate and replatform, which is basically the difference between homogeneous and heterogeneous. So actually, in the first concept, it's more about the ownership and, and the scope. On the second, it's the homogeneous versus heterogeneous. The third concept is the generic concept of a Delta-based migration, and it's going to I couldn't find a good word for it. I don't know if there is a word. Maybe we need to find a better term for it, but I call it the Delta-based migration. 
and then the different methodologies which are on the market that can be used for the um, actual migration itself. So let's talk about the first concept. And I try to put everything into one slide, but based on our experience, based on the many, many projects we did in the past, what we see is a company switching infrastructure provider. They go from on-premise to AWS, or they go from cloud A to cloud B, or they we see companies, they go out of the cloud, out of the cloud, back into self-hosting. We see companies switching the way they operate the SAP systems. They might operate themselves and they move it into a hosted environment where the SAP basis partner is managing the systems either on their own infrastructure or on a specific infrastructure provider. And then we see companies, of course, with a DBOS migration where they migrate between platforms typically what we see, of course, is the migration from any platform to Subhana. And then often we see a combination of any of the um, infrastructure basis partner or DBOS. So in most of the cases, specifically when I change the platform and the provider, I need to physically move the data from one location to another, which is a migration. The second concept, and this is really, really important, is the difference between relocate and replatform. Because many people talk about going to the cloud, and they also talk about replatform. And it's really two projects that need to be separated. They can be done in one uh, project, but they need to be separated from from a perspective. So it's either a homogeneous migration or a heterogeneous migration. So if you simply move your systems, it's simple relocate. If you replatform, it's a migration. And what we see in many of the cases is that companies want to do both. They want to move to the cloud and they want to replatform their environment. And one of the concepts we talk about is move, then migrate and utilize the cloud. And that's also something I'm going to present in one of the next slides. Actually, in the next slide. So <clears throat> this is what I see all the time. Customers are on-premise Oracle, and they want to go on HANA DB on AWS. In order to migrate your system heterogeneously, you need to export, copy, and import. I talk about more specifics, looking at the different technologies, but it's pretty much what it's going to come down to. You've got to export your data, copy it, and import. The copy is potentially optional, depending on where you uh, have your systems located. What we always like to do is relocate and then um, and then replatform because it's much easier. Once you're on a new environment, we just had a project where we migrated DB2 Linux to AWS uh, HANA. So what we did is we relocated the Linux systems into the AWS cloud first, and then did the export from there over weekend, and then re-imported into the HANA DB. So it's two projects, relocate and uh, re-platform, um, done by relocating first. Delta-based migration, and that can work with different technologies. It's working, it's, it's the methodology we are using when we are migrating and delta based really means we are moving the initial data load ahead of the migration window so if you think about a migration project we start the actual migration let's say four weeks before the migration happens and we are copying the complete database and then after that we keep track of the deltas in our case it's taking track of the uh, database log files and the flat file changes and continuously apply that um, those deltas to the new landscape that is already sitting at the new location. Once I have this up and running, specifically with AWS, we call this a bubble system, what you see in orange. We have the opportunity to completely isolate the new SAP system. We have unlimited CPU, unlimited servers in the cloud, start up a completely new system and just work through the migration um, on the test system with real data, with real logs, with a real timeline, and bring up the SAP system in an isolated environment. Then continue replicating, continue the um, delta-based um, log shipping, and then repeat in the cutover window what was already tested in the test and validation phase. This is the way we do the system um, migration for relocation. And this is also the way SAP is doing its NCDT 
near zero downtime uh, migration services. So the last concept before we go into the um, details is the cloud migration techniques. And this is really important. And again, I get a lot of emails. We migrate your systems in minutes. Um, it all has to fit into the framework I'm presenting on this screen. You can migrate via backup and restore, typically a homogeneous migration. You get backups from the old provider. You restore the backups in the new provider. Probably not working very well for the cloud because you can't really ship your backups to AWS. You could, but don't have to. So you backup and restore during the migration window, um, but it's not really um, necessary for homogeneous migration because you can do log shipping instead. Export and import is the way you do heterogeneous migration. And you have to really look at SAP and what SAP is supporting. And when you do a heterogeneous migration, SAP gives you two options. You do an export and an import, or you do an NCDT migration based on their um, trigger-based uh, solution, which is, again, SAP's NCDT. Otherwise, you have to do export-import. You can do block-based migrations. What we see in block-based migrations, that would be any tool that is replicating your VMware, keeps track of the um, deltas on a block level. What we see in the block-based migration, it doesn't really work well with large databases because they can't keep up with the data volume. What we are providing is a log file-based and flat file-based replication uh, where we um, copy the database first and then ship the log files. I'm going to explain that in more detail. And then for all the um, user sub and uh, sub MNT, we do the flat file based replication where we copy the system once or build the system once and then copy the deltas. If you go back to, in your mind, two slides forwards, when we do the relocate and then the replatform, what we are building is we do a log file based replication to do the initial sync based on the delta replication. We keep, keep track of the flat files, do a homogeneous migration first. Once we are on the cloud, we are doing the um, export import to um, get the systems up and running in the cloud. So these are a couple of introductory points just to set the scene. It was a lot of information, very concentrated, but once we're looking at the software, I think it's going to make more sense. But again, if you see emails, if you see uh, presentations uh, migrate without downtime, um, that only works for NCDT. Um, you really have to do either block-based, flat file, log file-based the way we do it, um, or do the export-import for heterogeneous migrations. One more slide on the um, application stack is also positioning the log file based replication combined with the file based replication and contrasted with the storage based replication where you replicate on the storage layer storage blocks make up files files that make up databases databases make up applications we replicate on a database layer slash application layer with a database log files and binaries and critical files replicated separately So what we are offering is uh, a combination of a software solution called DB Shadow or FS Shadow. It's combined in a solution called Business Shadow. And we have a service concept wrapped around it where we work with the customers on planning, building, implementing the, um, the migration. So, and again, this is focused on a homogeneous migration. After you're done with the homogeneous migration, you will do the export import where we can help too. So, the DB Shadow software is a software that replicates databases based on database log files. We have a DB Shadow for Oracle, we have one for HANA, we have one for MS SQL Server, we have one for Sybase, and all the SAP platforms that are supported. And then we have a FS Shadow that is replicating files between the two systems. So that would be, again, the sub MNT, any kind of interface data, or eventually uh, files that are not necessarily inside SAP, files that are somehow related inside SAP to SAP interface data or data coming from an EDI system. We are 
implementing the software by installing a small agent on source, a small agent on target. We have one step, which is non-recurring, which is an initial sync, and we have one step and um, on the left-hand side called archiver, which is continuous, the same as the third step. We continuously ship changes to the mirror system and continuously apply those changes to the mirror system in order to build this delta-based replication. We also intentionally Q log, so it's intentionally asynchronous. So we do an initial sync and then we keep the standby system in a in a delayed status. We need to be able to Q log files for the mock cutover for any kind of network interruptions, and they can can be queued on source or on target. The server agents are sitting on source system, sitting on the target system. We are providing a management interface. In the current version, it's still uh, Java-based. In the next version, which is already available in parallel, it's, um, it's a web-based uh, interface that communicates with a master server, and then the master server is uh, communicating with the worker agents. And then those server agents have generic processes, copy, archiver on source, and recover on the target system. And then it ties into the respective database, Oracle DB2, MS SQL Server, MySQL, MaxDB, was running out of space, um, ASE, um, HANA DB, it works the same. It's just HANA and ASE, they are sitting on the new platform. This is a slide from the old platform. That's why it wasn't included here. So, the database replication is log file based, so we look at a production system. This is called DR system. Uh, it should have been called a standby system, but we also do this for building our DR uh, databases. We have again the three phases, initial copy, non-recurring, archiver continuously and recover continuously. And then we can work with either the primary log directory, secondary log directory, copy the log files and make sure the database keeps uh, recovering. So the DB shadow is automating the lock uh, shipping and the lock recovery on the standby system. And it gives you a way of automating the a lot of the tasks that you would have to do manually as part of the migration. And what I see as an advantage is really the point that you don't have to do this manually. So people can focus much more on the on other uh, important migration tasks, which there will be many. Now, interesting, and this is a tool that is only provided by Libelle, you have to find a way not only to get the files over to the DR system or to the standby system once, you also have to find a way to keep the file system in sync. You can write scripts doing async on Windows, you can write Robocopy scripts, or we have an integrated tool which is doing the same what we do for databases for file systems. So we define sub MNT. And then on a directory level, we can include or exclude files. For example, we might exclude the job logs because they're taking up a lot of traffic and don't really provide any value until we need them at the um, after the cutover or we might not need them depending on how we set it up. So our FF archiver is continuously picking up changes from the source system. Let's say every 20 minutes, copies them to the DR system as a log file or FF log file and then applies the changes to the standby system. And this is how it works. Let's say every 20 minutes, our FF archiver is checking the file system and compares what was changed, creates a flat file list, and create real flat file log files that are then transferred to the standby system, or again, the DR system, and then apply to the DR system. So this is basically a log shipping for, for uh, uh, file systems. It's it's, uh, it's really neat and it's a really good way to keep file systems synchronized. I'm going to skip over the screenshots because uh, Vamsi can, can show that uh, live, how this is working, um, and want to talk a bit more about the actual migration workflow. So we talked in the beginning about the methodologies. I talked a little bit about the software architecture, how Libella is designed to work the DB shadow for the databases, the FS shadow for the flat files, and then the DB shadow working for Oracle, working for DB2, working for MaxDB, MS SQL Server, HANA, Sybase, and I hope I didn't miss any of the platforms. Now, of course, our DB shadow is working differently for different databases. On Oracle, we have reader log files. On DB2, we have offline log files. It works similar for DB2. MS SQL Server, we have transaction log backups that are being triggered 
on HANA, it's it's slightly different also on the actual migration because HANA has this continuous log recovery, which can access can be accessed by system replication, but not by outside tools. So there's a way to do a full backup, potentially include include snapshot backups and then include the log files. But either way, we 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 usually cover that. Let's talk about the migration workflow. On a high level, these are the steps, and then think again the delta migration slide I showed earlier. This is the same workflow, just from a different, uh, differently um, illustrated. We prepare the systems, install the agents, we do an initial sync, activate replication, and this is again four weeks or even two weeks, or we could even do it three months before the migration. Do a test switch over. The secondary system can be afterwards either completely rebuilt from scratch or you keep a copy and then um, uh, restore the copy and then continue with the original data that was transferred. Now, specifically with AWS, you don't need to throw away the primary system. You can easily do snapshots on Amazon Web Services and just build a bubble system, isolate a bubble system, bring up a new server and test there. And then the live switch over can be either just bringing up the secondary system on the the secondary system as primary or even reverse the replication that we replicate back to the old system and have a standby system which used to be the production system. You could even build multiple replications. So we have customers that was outside the AWS context that was on on on-premise system, but they had three locations. They had their source system, they had their DR system, and then they had their new disaster recovery um, location. And basically you have A, B, and C, and we can fail over from A to B and then continue replicating from B to C. Since cloud has the advantage of elasticity, meaning there is unlimited regions, unlimited servers, and for a migration we might even need those resources only temporarily, you could set up just a second or a third replication just as a backup and keep different states of your environment in addition to your on-premise environment during the migration or even after the migration. So let's look at the migration workflow. <clears throat> and I have uh, probably uh, 10 more minutes, uh, eight to 10 more minutes before we go into the uh, tool demo. But I wanna walk you through the uh, eight steps we see for the migration. We finalize the migration plan in the beginning. We need to install SAP on the new systems or make SAP available on the new systems, set up the agents, do an initial sync, maintain replication until we do the actual migration. We do a mock migration and then again, maintain replication, but we are adding sanity checks leading up to the uh, migration window because we have in the uh, mock migration, we have a reasonable amount of uh, margin for errors. For the actual cutover, there are, is a whole business expecting to run on a new environment and there might be key users which are expected to do testing. So we don't want to mess up the cutover. So we have a lot of sanity checks we, we provide or we recommend and then we have the actual cutover window. So let's talk about the migration plan. And this is really standard uh, project management and we have migration plans we used for other customers we have best practices but it's really up to you how you handle it but of course it needs roles responsibilities it needs a timeline it needs the different migration phases and that's also something we see in the sap landscape which is an advantage you always have your non-production landscape and you have your production landscape and we still recommend a mock migration without real data but you could consider migrate or customers, 90% of the cases, they migrate their test systems, they migrate their sandbox systems, then they migrate their QA, and at the end, they migrate production. That way they did three migrations before they actual touch the production. That is something we, we usually see in the migration projects. Um, success and failure criteria. Many times in the migration projects, I don't see these formally defined. Um, there is an issue that comes up that wasn't planned for and nobody really thought this through ahead of time and you should 
put in some thoughts in what's the success criteria, at what time uh, do we abort the migration and, and stay with our production system and then do it at a different uh, weekend. Uh, what are primary contingencies? What happens if something fails? Do we abort? What is a secondary contingency? Let's say we failed over, can we roll back? Can we go back to the old system or what is the point of no return? And then define some KPIs. What are the key performance indicators for uh, the system to be functionally uh, available and functionally ready from the user perspective? After <clears throat> the um, planning, we need to get SAP up and running on the new environment. There are three options. We can just clone the system, we can install a new SAP system, and we copy. We can copy the binaries. Different options have different advantages. If your SAP grew over years and years and years, I would always, I always prefer to install a fresh and clean SAP system from scratch. Go through the process. It's not slowing anybody down it's happening three or four weeks ahead of the system yes it takes a couple of hours but that way you have the clean have a super clean sap system installed all the users are created the os is is, is ready the users are ready and you don't have to fix anything in any kind of log files or, or um, profiles um, to adjust the host name or the server if you want to clone the system i'm not a big fan of cloning the system because it's really it should work, could work, but it's it's has been defined on for different hardware for different CPUs, um, so it's not really the same system that we would have after clean installation. And then copy the binaries. I don't want to see that on Windows, but if you have to do that and it's Linux, we we can live with it and we saw it being successful. There's really no big deal. But if you can install an empty SAP system, it's just it's just cleaner. The database, in either way, we copy that fresh after the clone. Yes, theoretically, it was already copied and is there, but we prefer if you do a fresh copy uh, of the database that it is in a state that it can receive log files uh, properly. Next step is we are setting up the agents and the GUI. That's a 15 to 20 minutes work. We are putting the files there. We are starting the agent, and then they can start uh, receiving uh, replication commands, which is initial copy, backup, and restore. So now we need to do the initial database and file replication sync. And this is also that is often overlooked. You have a five terabyte system and now you need to migrate that to the cloud. And you know, this is gonna take me five days to copy, right? But the point is, it doesn't really matter because we are four weeks or eight weeks before the actual migration. So we can copy those five terabytes and the copy might run for a week. But since we take care of the deltas in between, we just let it copy for five weeks. So we start the backup, finish the backup, copy the backup files, start the restore. After five days, we finally got the database copied, and all we got to do is catch up log files, which takes another one or two days if it's a huge database. And then we have an active replication going, and the systems are ready for the migration. Maintaining the replication, we want to see that monitoring procedures are established. We are looking at potential traffic peaks. So if you do, backup's not a really good example, but more the indexing for VW system. Uh, if you have production loads or any kind of a peak that is doing an unusual or causing an unusual pattern in, in log files, we want to look at that. Any kind of database structure changes, DB operation, Microsoft SQL Server is my favorite example. If you back up the transaction log, and maintain a replication. Um, sometimes customers just truncate the transaction logs. Usually doesn't have an impact, but if you maintain a replication, it breaks the replication. So something you gotta consider. Um, and then continuously do the log replication and set up the alarming that you get notified if something goes wrong because we wanna closely monitor what is happening. The mock migration, I mentioned it as a concept a few times before. Let's look at it from a timeline perspective. So we set up the replication. It's actively replicating. That means we have a recover running. We have an archiver running. So what we want to do is we want to stop recover and stop archiver to just get the standby system in a consistent state temporarily. And then we clone the server or we do a snapshot of the disks attach the disks to a completely new server, which is in a different VPC um, in Amazon terms again. Um, and then uh, 
continue replication with my original server and um, we can do a complete test migration including the functional validation on a SAP system with the most current data and this is really something where you can train the uh, migration multiple times. If you again think about the relocate and then the re-platform this would be also where you can test the timeline of the export import so you have a cutoff window Friday evening you might even have um, user patterns and data patterns that fit your production on a Friday you bring up the standby system now do your exports do your imports and you can check how long would it take you to migrate to HANA and then start tweaking that process because in the export import there are a lot of things you can do to tweak it uh, it's really not unreasonable to get a system migrated in, in a day, less than a day for a couple of terabytes. And after that, for the production systems or production replication, we start archiver and we start recover and continue the replication. So we are almost done. We did the mock test. Now we want to maintain the replication again. And what we want to add is the sanity checks. So overall, it's the same as before, but we want to look very closely to it. We want to add DB Verify. There are options to open the database as reader only. You can do additional snapshots and bring it up a day before uh, in, in an isolated environment. Again, it's all automated, can be automated. You want to check the replication logs, the recovery behavior. For example, MaxDB, you might have some logs that are created every two minutes, but they might take 10 minutes to recover. How is that impacting the cutover window? and do uh, FF verification validations. I want to show that to you quick. So we have this feature which is compa comparing file system between source and target when you trigger this FF verify and we recommend that doing this daily before the migration to see if for any reasons any files haven't been copied, haven't been copied at all, have been missing, uh, have a different file size or anything wrong with the files. And some of it is expected. For example, there are chop locks that are missing on the target system. In this case, they are missing because we excluded them. But there might be an issue with the uh, file size. So one file is bigger than the other. This is something we often see in log files that keep continuously growing. So we want to know which are the differences between source and target. Is there anything we need to look into? Sometimes we saw in the FF Verify that there is a user missing on the target system or a user has the wrong permission. So we would detect this in the FF Verify. And this gives you good information ahead of the migration because you can then fix it or at least you know, hey, there's a user missing on the DR system or on the new system. I got to fix this during the cutover window. The cutover after all the work we did from step one to step seven, the cutover is simply replaying everything we did before the same way. And this is also, again, offloading the work from the cutover window to ahead of times. It is more time than just doing everything on the, more work than everything doing everything uh, in the weekend, but it is spaced out and we have a lot of space for um, uh, issues and errors we can address and fix ahead of time. But the finalized activities on old productions, we stop the systems, uh, stop the database with SAP, run the archive a few more minutes or a few more times, make sure everything is shipped, initiate the failover. From our side, the failover is orchestrated. So we bring up the system, we rename the database if necessary, and everything is there. And then um, we start up SAP, start up the database, smoke testing, by SAP basis, smoke testing by functional team and reroute the network users to the new location. One to five should have been done in the mock testing. We do it, of course, again, the same way, you know, maybe even more intensive. And then the last step, reroute the users to the new location. Last slide before I hand over to Wamsi to just have a quick, uh, maybe 10, 15 minute look at the um, demo is looking at the Amazon Web Services concepts we usually utilize as part of those migrations. Back to my uh, introduction, Google Platform and uh, Azure is the same. Many of the service providers have their private clouds. They provide the same. It's all about provisioning, virtualization. So, But let's talk about some of the AWS concepts we, we utilize. So if it's a large migration and you migrate hundreds of systems, you can migrate 
to smaller systems and use what Amazon calls pilot light installations. We might even only copy the files, but we can always change the servers at a later point to a larger system. The initialized synchronization, they have options. You can just copy whatever network is available into the Amazon Web Services Cloud, but there is a direct link available you can test or utilize. You can use the Snowball where Amazon provides you uh, storage you can attach uh, to your services, uh, to your servers, and then ship it to Amazon and they restore it there for you if it's super large, might be a great option. You, in the mock migration, we uh, use the VPC technology to create separate VPCs, that there's no way this SAP system is talking to anybody or anything uh, outside this bubble. We're using the EBS S3 uh, snapshots to S3 to, um, for bringing up the uh, for for the uh, mock test and also to bring up the new hardware if required if we clone anything. The server build can be automated. It's something we have uh, conceptualized but didn't implement yet. But in order to build all the servers or add more servers, you can use CloudFormation. Installing SAP, you can just do manually, but Amazon has best practices and they have quick start server where they say this is the way you should install SAP, build SAP on AWS that it runs uh, in the best way. You could, I don't see it really necessary, but if you want to clone the VM, there's an export import feature on AWS for cloning the VMs. I don't see it being necessary because we want to see a clean SAP install to begin with. And then redirecting the users is simply how you manage your network, but Route 53 is one option to redirect the users to the new network. So with that, I want to ask Wamsi to just pull up the uh, DB Shadow software and FS Shadow software to show to the audience and talk a little bit about uh, how the software works in, in real life. I hope you all can see my screen here. So this is the interface which Bernd was talking about. On the left-hand side, you have the source system. And on the right-hand side, we have the target system to which the database is being copied over. And those little green dots that you see, these are the archive files. So this is an Oracle replication that's happening from left machine to the right machine and the Locks are being continuously uh, replayed on the target machine. Um, let me quickly walk you through the setup part here. Uh, it's straightforward uh, setup. You have to define or uh, on your primary system the host name, the Oracle SID, and the Oracle um, home directory, and where we should pick the archives from. And the same should be defined for the target system or the secondary system. If you look at the secondary system, the SID. Um, is having a, a string S in the end, which is to differentiate that this is the target system and this is the source system. So we don't want to get confused if we have the same um, uh, Oracle sits on both sides. So that's the reason why we just put an S for shadow or uh, a copy of the original system. But if you want to have it as um, AS12, that's perfectly fine as well. And then we have multiple copy options. Uh, we can, uh, we have, we have defined here uh, parallel copy threads as four. So we'll open four uh, parallel channels and copy the uh, the database and the archive files. And we also do some checks whether there is enough space on the source and tar on the target system to copy the uh, database and uh, to copy the archive files. And uh, we also check um, the environment to make sure that uh, it is consistent. And then we start the two processes after copy, which is the archiver and recover. Archiver process basically copies the file from the archive directory to the recover directory. And the recover process is basically uh, taking the file from here and replaying it on their standby system. And then there are other parameters like whether we want to create a control file or whether we want to create a standby control file and how the files should be transferred, should be should we transfer them in compressed mode. And if there are any directories missing on the target side, do you want the tool to create the directory or you want uh, to handle them manually or the tool error out if there is any missing directory. Typically in case of migrations, 
we would always select this option here because we want the directory structure to be exactly like source. So we just say create a full path and directory. And then when we look at the archiver options, how we want to ship the files, um, we have an option called switch log file. So if we don't have a log file in this directory uh, for say 10 minutes, we forcibly do a switch log file. And then we copy the file to the standby system. Uh, if there are multiple log files, then we, of course, will use this parallel archiver process, which means currently we have set it to 10, so it will copy 10 archive files at a time. If uh, for some reason you don't want the software to access the primary archive path, you can always define the secondary archive path and we pick up the files from that secondary location and we clean up the location. In that way, you define a specific archive location for Libelle and we pick up the files and we do the maintenance of that uh, mount point basically. The same goes with recover. One of the interesting concepts is the recover delay here. So we all currently set to four hours and four minutes. So basically what this means is we're trying to keep the target system or the secondary system four hours behind the source system. And that's the reason why you have here archive files piled up. <clears throat> You can also see it here. You have a recover delay of um, 244 minutes, and this would be approximately four hours behind the production system. The reason being this is, uh, for, for this is to basically, um, if there are any human-made errors or somebody accidentally delete any files or any cables on the source system, you might want uh, those changes not to be replayed immediately. So you could always set this to zero, uh, that is what we actually do when we are doing the uh, when we are in the cutover phase. When we are doing the cutover, we set this to zero so that all the files are applied, and then we open the the standby system basically. So there are some options on the recovery side as well. Like, do you want to verify the files that you got? And then we also can enable the parallel recovery. Currently, it's set to forty, which means four recovery sessions. And then we do periodically check the structure. Uh, in the sense, we check whether are there any new data files that got added on the source side, which needs to be replicated on target system. So here it says every 30 minutes, I'm going to do a quick check of the structure. And if the structure changes, I'm going to mimic the same changes on the uh, source system, uh, on the target system. And then if there are no logging transactions, do you want to flag them or not? Currently, it's set to flag, but in BW, you might want to uh, uncheck this one. And uh, there are some other features like mappings, which we typically don't use in migrations. But if you want to um, use this to build a system out of PRD database, for example, if you want to copy the PRD database to, say, the quality system or, or, or sandbox system, you can do a directory mapping in the sense it's slash Oracle PRD to slash Oracle QAS, and the files will be copied from the PRD system to QAS system. So this tool has multiple facets, and one of the uh, uh, use case is migration. There are other uh, scenarios where we can use this tool to build a uh, copy of the production system to quality and things like that. So once we do the setup, we perform an initial copy. Uh, so if we go here, there is an option to start copy in the control option. And once the copy is triggered, uh, what happens in, in, in terms of Oracle is each table space is put to backup mode and the data files concerning the table space are copied over from uh, source to target. And once the data files for that specific table space are copied, then the table space is taken off backup mode and then the next table space is, is, is triggered or put to backup mode. Once the initial copies are triggered, also there is a parallel thread which runs to start shipping the archive files. So the copy will be running and also the archiver process will be running and uh, shipping the files. And once the initial copy is done, the archiver and recover automatically will handle shipping the files and recover periodically, applying the logs and maintaining that recover delay. And we do give some statistics on how the performance is and what's the transfer rate and things like that. So uh, it's pretty straightforward and we do the same thing for any database out there. Let me quickly go ahead and uh, 
talk about uh, the switch over or cut over. So there are multiple options that we provide here. Again, in terms of uh, migrations, we are talking about uh, two end of logs. So this is the option that we would select. Uh, but there are other options uh, which are valid in case of uh, disaster recovery or in case of maintenance activities that you want to perform. Also, these options depending upon uh, what database we are working on. For example, if you are working on MaxDB database, you would not see certain options. If you're working on, um, say, SQL Server, you're, you're not uh, seeing certain options here. So it also depends upon what kind of database that you're working on. Uh, just to briefly tell you, define switch is to flip the roles. Basically, currently, this is a production system on the left side. And on the right side, you have the standby system. But if you do a define switch, the roles are flipped. So the arrow direction will go the other way. So the standby will become production and the source will become uh, a standby system. So uh, this is. Um, used in case if you want to test your disaster recovery environments. Uh, so you, you will flip your complete production landscape to a different data center, and then the data center is basically acting as production. And then your actual production data center is, is behaving as a uh, DR center. And then admin switches for maintenance activities, like um, if you want to change the network interface and things like that, end of locks is, is implied, so whatever locks that are provided to the tool, they are applied, and then the database is open. When I say database is open, currently the database is mounted as uh, AS12S. So we have to recreate the control file, we have to change the uh, parameters, and um, we have to create new SP files and P files to uh, make sure that it is working at production scale, because uh, there are some parameters that we uh, define to uh, work at uh, minimal uh, on minimal resources. The reason being, this is just a standby system, so it's not at production scale. So we put some parameters in the in our file to make sure it's working at, at very uh, low uh, resources. But once it goes production scale, then we have to use the actual parameters that are there on the production system. So we provide we update the shared memory uh, variables and all that stuff, and then we bring this database up at production scale. The same principle applies for flat files. So this is a flat file replication that's happening. The initial copy, the archiver, and the recover process, everything remains the same. Uh, the only thing is with regard to uh, switchover, um, you see much less options because we want to do uh, only to end of locks here. Um, again, for DR purposes, we can do a defined switch. If for some reason you want to recover only this first log file and, and skip this the second log file here, then you can definitely go ahead and select a point in time and define till what time you want to recover and the database will be recovered or the flat files will be recovered only to that point in time. And, and the same principle works for DB Shadow, uh, the same end of logs and MaxDB uh, and SQL Server. So it's uh, it's a but pretty generic concept, which should work for all databases. Again, there are, of course, uh, some exceptions, like uh, lossless switches not available uh, on some databases, um, for example, flat files, um, <clears throat> or admin switches not available. Uh, I think that should be it. Um, Wait. Oh, you, Brent. Great, and then thanks, Vamsi, for the uh, presentation. Let me switch back to the PowerPoint. I want to do a quick summary and then open for any potential uh, questions. I want to do a quick recap of the topics we um, captured and talked about today. So the uh, data replication options for cloud migration, the uh, different <coughs> concepts, and I'm going to share my slide deck with you with all the different um, methodologies I presented and when they apply and when not. Uh, installing SAP on the new systems, set up database replication, set up file replication, the workflow of um, the different steps as part of the migration. We went through the cutover weekend contingency uh, planning, executing the cutover, and then we looked at the uh, tool demo. So with that, we have um, a couple of more minutes, and I want to go back to the end of the presentation. 
and open the Q&A feature. So you have, um, here we go. You have a Q&A feature in your GoToWebinar and then we would see the questions here. And I have two questions uh, coming in and Vamsia might need your help on the first one. I think I can answer it, but I, I let you handle it. Any rule of thumb, how long it would take to copy a five terabyte database? Um, it, it's it's not, uh, there is no rule of thumb, honestly. Uh, it depends upon the bandwidth that we, or the throughput that we normally get. As you have seen in the in the shared memory or in the um, in the uh, demo that I've shown you on the our software, um, we can throttle the performance depending upon the bandwidth that we get. We can increase the parallel sessions. We can increase the socket size. Um, we can we can increase the way that the files are handled. We, if if we have very good network, we can use uh, the pipe mechanism instead of backup restore. There there are multiple options. Uh, I don't I don't have a thumb rule. Uh, I have seen performance. Uh, on both ends, ends of the spectrum um, where I've seen performance of 5 MB per second um, to, to to even even uh, 150 MB or so per second. So it all depends upon how good the network is. Can I, next question is, can I replicate from Oracle Unix to Oracle, Oracle Unix to Oracle Linux? Um, I, I can answer that. I think you could, but you shouldn't. And we don't really want to do that. It, it could work. It might work, but it might not. And I, I think you have a certain um, uh, freedom when you migrate non-production system because at the end it's only a test system and you can rebuild it. But I would never recommend this for anything in production. So you could, but I, I don't think it, anybody would support that. And we certainly would definitely stay away from it because it's just not the way you're supposed to do it. Um, where does the graphical user interface uh, reside? Maybe Vamsi, if, if you talk about that, because you have all kinds of scenarios in your projects. Uh, it, it stays on, on your desktop typically, uh, but if you want that to be shared or multiple people accessing it, it's uh, not a bad idea to put that on a, a a terminal server where everybody can log in and access the same GUI and the same configuration. Uh, the graphical user interface is fairly light. It's small jar file. And then you have a uh, XML file on the same location where the jar file is, is placed. And this XML file basically holds uh, some basic configuration, which is basically the port number, uh, the configuration name, and the uh, source host and the target host. All, all uh, this information is used by the, uh, by the jar file to communicate and to get the configuration details. Okay, uh, last question I see and there's more coming in. Is the communication between the two servers encrypted? And uh, from our end, uh, the answer is no, we currently do not encrypt it. It's going to come in one of the next versions. So our assumption is, and that's how you set up the AWS uh, direct link, uh, that it has to communicate over secure network. So we wouldn't recommend uh, going over the public internet unless you um, you, you build it specifically, uh, wrap a VPN tunnel around it, but got to make sure that this is communicating on a secure uh, communication line between the two servers. Okay, that was the last question for today. I appreciate everybody joining us on a, on a Friday. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, if you have any questions, reach out to Vamsi, reach out to me, uh, reach out to Jillian who sent the uh, email invites anytime. Um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead, close the presentation and um, hope everybody's having a good day. Thank you and bye-bye.